And we are live. Welcome to the show. I'm here with Professor Marilyn Horowitz. My name is Jeff Rivera, and she's the author of the book, Four Magic Questions of Screenwriting. And I'm really excited to talk about this because I really enjoyed reading the book. And, and Professor Horowitz, Marilyn, more than graciously let me read this book. Um, it's worth every penny you pay for it. She, the author, the professor extraordinary is going to go through the book in detail with us as much as we can get in within 30 minutes. But I really encourage you to go on Amazon or anywhere you can possibly get the book. It's called The Four Magic Questions of Screenwriting. Professor Horowitz, let's begin. Yes. Um, hi, Jeff. Ready to rock and roll? Here we go. Uh, I always love having <laughs> doing these things with you. There's just so much energy. Um, I just want to say that because I just launched my new website, we have kind of a special going on so that if you go and you want to buy one of my video products, I have classes that support my various books. We are giving away free hard copies of the Four Magic Questions just for the next couple of days in part to honor the seminar that we're giving. Uh, oh, it's a $29.95 value and uh, we're hoping that um, uh, that people will go. My audio stuff is my giving my classes. They're very succinct. They're short. But because I have a trademark writing method, although my books are excellent, it's also very good to have the audio or video support. Okay, excellent. Well, I encourage everyone to check out her website, which is MarilynHorowitz.com. And she is a wealth of knowledge. And I don't know if you realize how amazing it is to have her because she's one of the premier uh, professors on film and screenwriting. And so it's a, a true honor for us to spend her time with us to explain this. And this is why I really encourage you to go get the book, The Four Magic um, magic Questions of Screenwriting, because if you're stuck and you just can't get out of, if, if you feel like you're stuck in your story and you just cannot figure out what's going on, what's wrong with it, this is an excellent book to read, not only before you start screenwriting, but also during and afterward. And let's just talk about this because one of the more most important parts, um, Ms., uh, you, you asked me to call you Professor, or asked me to call you Marilyn, but I can't help it. I'm going to call you Professor Horowitz. But, uh, one of the one of the, the great uh, parts I loved about this book, Professor Horowitz, is that you really emphasize how important structure is. So, what is structure in the first place, and why can't we just wing it, just start writing? That's a great question. I wish more people asked and had a little more hostility towards the party line structure. Um, unfortunately, uh, movies, uh, as they were originally conceived, are a business product, yes. And like a wine bottle, they only can have a certain amount of liquid in them in order to qualify. So um, a movie is quite a rigid format. Um, originally, there were all kinds of you know, legal reasons and monetary reasons which remain today. But primarily, it's also a form that sets us free because it's linear. Unlike books, which can happen laterally, a screenplay literally is, is watched by the audience in time and needs to be written in time using time. So um, uh, the, the common wisdom is the Aristotelian model of the three-act structure. The caveat is we have to remember, which people don't, is that Aristotle's poetics, which is the tome on which all contemporary drama is, theory is based, was actually a book of fragments, most of, most of which was lost. And uh, the largest piece of which was lost was comedy. And so we have to really thank movies like, um, uh, you know, what's the thing that, that uh, uh, Little Miss Sunshine for bringing, you know, uh, uh, gravitas back to comedy because for many years tragedy was greatly overweighted and in part because uh, the tragedy section of the Aristotle book had been saved while the comedy version had been lost. So for all of you out there who find it shocking that we pray to a book of fragments, well, welcome to the movie business. Right. But why, why do we need to really focus on structure? I mean, why can't we just focus on just writing and seeing what happens and, and, and you know, whatever happens, happens? Why can't we just do that? Why can't we just wing it? Okay. Why is structure so important? Okay, the answer to your question really is another question, which is when. Because I do believe, unlike many of my colleagues, that when first creating any story, you need to wing it. You know, the motto of my writing system is don't get it right, get it written. So I think that the first draft of a movie ought to be however you do it, 
I don't even think you should bother with screenplay format. I think you should just get the story out, try to hear all the pieces of dialogue. Don't get it right, get it written. At that point, you must put the template of structure because, as I said, like wine, it needs to be sold in stores and people have to know what they're buying. Right. I'm so glad that we're talking about this, Professor Horowitz, because I did the exact same thing. I'm working on a novel actually right now, the prequel to my first novel, and I did exactly what you said. I just um, didn't worry about getting it right. I just got it written. It's just me vomiting on page. Just a, uh, just, just try, try to diarrhea. Try to <laughs> a little more elegant than vomiting. <laughs> okay. Well, I have, I have, I have something on paper now that I can look at and work with, and now this is why the book that you've written, the Four Magic uh, Questions of Screenwriting, is really, really important to me because I can now apply these, uh, these techniques for when I'm rewriting and restructuring um, this story. Absolutely. Now, the so just let me make this point, okay? Which is that you, the reason that you need structure or the Aristotelian structure is because the audience is very savvy and the audience expects a certain amount of story. If you follow a version of the Aristotelian model, you will deliver enough story so that people will pay their $13 for it. There's a very simple reason why you have to write a certain amount of story. Okay, that's just to get that out of the way. Okay, now what you did is perfect. I think your timing is perfect. The way that you use the four magic questions at your level of a wonderful, juicy, messy, yummy first draft is you divide the story into four pieces. And the system works so well that if your story is, let's say, 400 pages, um, it's 100 pages for each of these sections. You label one act one, you label one act two part one, you label uh, third part act two part two, and you label the fourth part act three. This is very, very, very rough. This is like the caveman version, okay? And then what you do is you, you read about what the questions are for each of these things, and then you reread your chunk, and you see how much of it conforms. And even if it's out of order, you're going to see that basically that first section covers the five W's. You know, ask the first magic question, which is, what is my hero's dream? Now, the reason that it's critical is that uh, stories, even if they are ensemble pieces or seemingly abstract, are always character-driven. And if you use the spine of the, of the character's journey as your benchmark, then you can hang off all these other interesting subplots and other people's stories, but you will always have a through line so your audience will not get lost. And that is a primary reason to focus on one character, and that character should always be the character that has the most to lose. That's a little tip. And so when you're doing your prequel, Jeff, if you've settled on a character, who does not seem to have the most to lose, you have to do two things. Change his or her backstory so they are that character or use a different character. Be ruthless. I like that a lot. I like I like how you said that you need to pick the character, especially if you're doing an ensemble piece where uh, the character that has the most to lose. I did find that I really followed a lot of what you said in um, this book because in my first draft it was sort of like everyone's different pl subplots and this would be really kind of cool and da, da 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 and really just like you said you need one common thread that go all the way through from the beginning to the end and that's what I've really found myself doing in this in this prequel as I'm kind of re-outlining it and putting it yes. sort of in a structure is I, I have one thread, one main storyline that's going all the way through. Excellent. And then you can wrap, you know, it's like a caduceus. It's like, you know, the, the, the serpents wrapped around the medical thing. You can, you, can, you, can, you can add as much as you want to, but you have to have a solid spine or it's not going to have a feeling of unity, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about the second uh, magic question. The first one was, what is the main character's dream? And the second one is what? What is the main character's nightmare? I, I love uh, that. Let me let me backtrack if I may. The, um, okay. the the questions are structured because um, because I'm a coach and because I've been teaching at NYU for 15 years and I've probably taught a thousand people more and more to write screenplays and I really just couldn't bear reading bad stuff. I had to. Come <laughs> up, I know it's completely it's all about me. Um, uh, I had to find a way so that writers never wrote badly. And what I discovered was that the the uh, the uh, uh, the creative process was not orderly in the way that other screenwriting teachers had hoped. And what I discovered was 
we could pretty much figure out the beginning and the end of a movie, act one and act three, or a novel, because what is the main character's dream is answered in question four by does he or she achieve her dream or get a new one. So pretty much you could know the first hour of your screenplay or the first two chunks of your novel, at least in this, on this general level, right? Um, and then uh, if we understood that we needed a huge sea change to have some momentum, so that there was enough story, then we could say, well, if the first act was the dream, you know, for example, in Godfather, the you know, first act is a dream. Michael's very happy. He goes to the wedding. He's going to have his own life. He's going to marry his, his, his non-Italian wife. He's going to be a lawyer. And then act two is a nightmare. Boom, at the end of act one, his father's shot, and the only way that he can save his father's life is to pick up a gun. Suddenly, he's a gangster. So act two is the nightmare. Because now he is thrown into the world where he must shoot the drug dealer, shoot the policeman, and go into hiding to Sicily. He is now a criminal. So in the blink of an eye, in his attempt to do the right thing, he has landed just where he was afraid to go. Okay, so that's why you need such a strong thing. Now, you can flip it. The dream, you know, Act 1 can be the nightmare, and Act 2, Part 1 can be the dream. And Witness, Act 1, which is the movie we use in the book, he's a cop, he's in Philadelphia, He's a happy clam. He doesn't have to deal with people. All he does is solve murder after murder. He's a god, right? What happens at the end? He finds out his boss is crooked. Someone tries to kill him. He ends up in Amish country, wounded, no gun, framed for murder, unable to solve the crime. He's in hell. So there's a case of, of the opposite, right? One is the dream nightmare, and one is the nightmare dream. But the trick is there are 180 where you don't get enough momentum to get you into Act 2, Part 2, which is where so many screenplays fall down and so many novels. Okay? So a lot of times people have problems with what I like to call the stuff in the middle. You know? Yeah, that, that, <laughs> long, that long second act can be a real yeah. bear. But that's just what I like about your book is that you really have divided the different acts uh, into four different parts, and so it's not just a big chunk in the middle. You, it's kind of an e equal part. Um, for example, in a screenplay, ideally, as you said in the book, is a da daily 120 pages, 120 yeah. minutes. So you've actually divided up in your book um, each section into 30-minute chunks. So the yeah, same kind of thing could be done um, probably in a novel, just sort of equal parts. You prorate it. Right. You prorate it exactly. Well, let's talk about the third question. Um, the third question of this uh, in, the, in the book, Four Magic Questions of Screenwriting, uh, is there, one that I absolutely love. Let's talk about that. That's all the trouble is. I mean, if you haven't that's had all the trouble is. now. So, so the idea is when you're, when you're structuring or you're restructuring, if you have a strong dream nightmare in Act, act 1, Act 2, Part 1, and then you have a strong third act, okay, where you, you have a pretty clear idea of what's going to happen in the end. Right, and even if you don't know your ending, you can always have a general sense. Either it's going to go well, badly, or different, right? Right, right. So now you've just structured two-thirds of your project. Act 2, Part 2 is gnarly because most people think that Act 2, Part 2 is just them dragging all the stuff in Act 2, Part 1 across for another 30 minutes or 100 pages, but that's not the case. Um, in terms of the original purpose of art, um, one of the purposes of art is to achieve for the reader or the viewer something called catharsis. And catharsis is when they get to identify with the journey that the, that the character has gone on and to take away the strength that the character develops in order to be able to enact the climax of Act 3. We have to ask ourselves, if the main character in Act 1 was already finished, why do we need a book? Why couldn't he just go do Act 3 right away? He must go on a journey, and something must happen to him in just the way it does in life, where he goes some, through some kind of a crucible or an experience where, in an alchemical sense, he's turned from lead to gold so that he or she now has the courage and the conus to enact what's required in Act 3. So to use our two examples, in The Godfather, what happens in Act 2, Part 2, not what you'd expect. He ends up... He's, he's, in, he's in Sicily. He's, he's away from all of the main work. He's on guard. He's guarded. He's in danger. But what happens to him is he falls in love with a woman. And that is, ironically, what humanizes him and makes him capable for the final battle because by humanizing him, he can experience loss. And when she is killed by his father's enemies, it is that 
event that kind of withers what has been a good and generous heart up until this point and turns him into the monster that he must become to save his family, which is why The right. Godfather is a tragedy. So Act 2, Part 2 is not more of the same. It's a completely different adventure with a completely different purpose and often right. a different location. Now, the reason I like to contrast and compare Witness, which is not a tragedy, um, is because they're a similar thing. He is stuck up in Amish country. He is ostracized. He is away from the main action. He cannot go back because he will be killed. And so he is forced to try to live in the society in the same way that Michael is. And uh, remember the famous barn raising scene where he you know, is capable. It looks like he might be quite a good Amish person. And then, of course, he falls in love with Kelly McGillis. And it escalates to a point where there's that famous scene where she is washing herself without her top, and they look at each other, and he says, you know, if I, if I make love to you, I can't leave and you can't stay, or, or some words to that effect. And they realize that, you know, if they come together, then both their lives will change. He will have to give up his dream of being a good cop, because now that he cares about something, he won't be fearless. She would have to leave her community, because she would be ostracized, and he doesn't want to break her son's life. And so he makes the choice at the end of Act 2, Part 2, to, to follow his duty. They go to back to Pennsylvania, and he picks a fight with some anti-Amish guy and shows that he has now returned to his former self and basically lays a trail so that his, the bad guys can track him down and there's a confrontation. So that movie is it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a triumph, but kind of a bittersweet one because in a modern-day world, one hopes maybe he could have had love too. But in the traditional sense... He chooses duty over love. Right. Okay. Well, As that's does one thing I really like. I like that um, you you did in in the four magic uh, questions of, of screenwriting is that you actually had quite a few examples of films that everyone really should watch. So you can see living examples of these these uh, questions. In fact, in, in interest of time, let's move on to the second one, but before we, I mean the, the last one, but in, before we do, uh, let me just review briefly what the questions are so far. The first one is What is my main character's dream? What is the main character's dream? The second What say it again? The second is, is what is my uh, main I missed that. What did he say? The first one is what is my main character's dream? Second is uh, what is my main character's nightmare? Okay, the third is who or what would mm -hmm. my uh, character die for, in air quotes, because if it's a comedy, it's not a literal death, it's a metaphor of death. And the third question, right. uh, fourth question is, does my main character attain his dream, forfeit it, or find a new one? Right. I, I, my favorite question, before you get to the last one um, in more detail, is that I love the third question, and, and that, once again, is who or what would they die for. I mean, this is at the point where the character is so desperate or so determined or so something that they're so passionate about it. They're willing to, to at least, as you said, metaphorically, um, die for what they want. And this, we're really emotionally invested by this time, and I, I really like that a lot. Um, let's go a little bit more detail into question number four, which you said is, what is the resolution of the dream or a new dream? In other words, uh, do they get what they wanted in, first, in the first question? Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Well, sure. I mean, obviously, um, you know, uh, when I have to work on pitches really fast, we make a, a hard decision about dream resolution, so we have, we have hard targets to hit. But when you're working as a creative artist, it's wonderful if you don't have to have a hard target, you can work with a soft target. So the soft target is you know how your movie's going to end. The character's either going to win, lose, have something else happen, some variation of that. For example, in Aquila and the Bee, which is one of my favorite movies, um, she is going to win the contests. But, and that would be the old adventure, right? But the new adventure is she refuses to win. She insists on sharing the victory with her so-called competitor because she knows that he will get into terrible trouble with his father. And she's not willing to have anybody lose big. So it it's a really wonderful film, and it takes it into a completely different direction. In Garden State, he, he should go home and go on to his meds, but instead he decides to stay and try to make it with his new girlfriend. It's a new adventure. This is a very modern, uh, recent addition to filmmaking that I just adore. In, um, oh, what was that wonderful movie, The Wrestler? Did you see that film? Oh, yeah. 
Oh that. my God, what a picture, right? Just when you think that, you know, Ricky Rourke is going to keep working in the convenience store and make up with his daughter, he's like, no, I'm going to die, I'm a wrestler, F that, and he goes, and hopefully, if he's lucky, will die in that fight. That, to me, is the okay. new, exciting ending where people have a chance at a new life, right? In The Godfather, he forfeits the dream because his dream in the beginning was to be independent, and at the end, he is the slave of his family. Right? Mm -hmm. In Witness, he achieves right. the dream because he gets to catch the bad guys. But in these other films I've mentioned, mm -hmm. they're far more original endings. But you know what, though? I think that there's a common thread in that, Professor Horowitz, and that thread is that um, they, the character gets to fulfill their destiny, whatever that is. Their true destiny may be to really get, get the girl, but maybe, again, it's, it's like in Witness for them to give up the girl to fulfill their true destiny, in his case, which is to fulfill his duty. What do you think about that, that? That's why you're a novelist, because you're deep. <laughs> that, is, that is exactly the point. That is exactly the point. And there's a famous Hindu proverb that says, if you would be happy, give up the life you planned and live the one you were meant to live. And that is a very much a subtext of movies. And your, your, your insight there is definitely an A++, and I can't wait to read your book. Oh, thank okay. you very much. Thanks a lot. I have another question for you that I wanted to ask you, Professor Horowitz. Um, my question is, um, you kind of talk about something, and you kind of gloss over it a little bit in the book, um, which I just it, it stood out to me like um, like a gold nugget. And one of the things that you said in it is uh, basically that it's a myth that just because you spend a lot of time writing a book, that doesn't mean it's going to be better. Can you talk yes. a little bit about that? Yes. Um, I, I, one of the things that I've learned in my 15 years of, of consulting and being a one-on-one -on -one coach as well as teaching thousands of people my method is that um, uh, you can't, if the, if the conception is wrong, polishing it is not going to fix it. In other words, if the apple's rotten, no matter how much you, you polish it, it's not going to make it any better. So part of the reason that I developed the Four Magic Question and my writing system, which can be found in my uh, book, How to Write a Screenplay in Ten Weeks, which I also use with my novelists, um, is this way we, we build the structure of the imaginary house properly. So the bathroom is in the right place, the basement is in the right place, as a metaphor, so that when we build the house, we don't suddenly discover after 15 drafts that we still have to do the kind of major surgery that requires a page one rewrite. Typically, people who learn my method can write a novel in less than four drafts, which should make you be very excited. Right, exactly. <laughs> one, one, don't get right, get it written. Two, get the story right. Three, perfect the voices and the point of view. And then after that, you do passes. You tweak, you know, you work on various things. That's my idea. Uh, because I think that's the only amount of sustainable attention. There aren't many novelists, you know, maybe like, you know, you and I are, and there are a few of us, but there are not too many people who have that much stamina. So I've tried to make this method very user-friendly and very 21st century. Um, people who work with me on screenplays generally get them done also in four drafts. Um, because because we you, you spend enough time building the structure because the writing system is character based, and that's why the questions are framed not in terms of the plot, like many others, but what is the character about? What is the character's dream? His nightmare? Her nightmare? These our fears and our hopes are what drive the way we behave. And so by working very deeply from the beginning and not being confused by the limitations of the physical world we were able to make very strong choices, which makes our rewriting pleasurable because we're not ever doing over. You see, we're reimagining. Well, there's, um, I'd like you to, to repeat the illustration you said once again about the, about the rotten apple. Before I ask you two more questions, I want to get in quickly because I know you're very busy and, and whatnot. But um, repeat again the illustration about the... Okay, okay. so, so if, if, you, if, you, if you are going to make a fruit salad, you have to pick a good piece of fruit. And if you don't, no amount of disguise, no amount of whipped cream and cherries is going to make that apple any better. <laughs> right. Point taken? Yeah, exactly. And okay. I love that. People can get in, 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 in the development stage in the, in the, when they're really starting to form the story, really get those, get those pieces ready. If there's just a bad idea, there's, if, there's, if one of the four questions is not answered correctly, then... You know, no, why write a whole... Again, 
you know, it's like dating, you know, it's like it doesn't get better. And if the more you invest in a bad idea or a bad person, the more time you spend defending that, you know. Mm -hmm. That's true. Amen to that. Well, let me ask you two quick questions. Um, I wanted to ask you, one of the things you, you said that I really like, I'm reading it um, from your book, it says, um, use what you know to start your story, don't worry about the rest. And one thing I wanted to say is that in your book, um, towards the end, you have a kind of an emergency bonus section, and you have yeah. this really cool sort of um, almost almost paint-by-numbers section that people can fill out, and that's the section you mentioned that quote, and I'll read it to you once again. It, you said, uh, use what you know to start your story, don't worry about the rest. A lot of people get stuck in doing it in order and whatnot. Can you talk about how they can use that that quote in a way to get the story finished? Sure. The, the great thing about stories is that they're all in your head, ready to come out. Okay, There's a wonderful book by uh, Stephen King on writing. It talks about how he just hopes that all the stories that are in his head will have time. And I know that they're like dreams. I mean, they might be compressed or whatever, but the moment you, you make the commitment and you say to your unconscious, okay, I'm going to try to write this out, all of the other parts of you go, hooray, and they rush to help you. And so That's by, true. by it's true, you know, you, you feel it. The moment you start to write all oh, it's like almost like they're angels flooding in and moving your pen. I mean, the trick is you have to show up and write. You know, and if you can't write anything good, copy someone else's writing. So this is a time honor trick. I, I used to be an expert on writer's block, as well, except I could do it in one class, so I could never make any money, so I had to change my specialty. But one of my tricks <laughs> is I say, pick up, you know, like my one of my favorite books is Portrait of the Artist of the Young Man as a Young Man by James Joyce. When I'm mm -hmm. stuck, I pick it up and I start to laboriously handwrite, you know, a chapter. And by the time I've written three lines, I'm already rewriting it and I'm back to myself. Oh, I love that. I love that. Let me ask you one quick question before we get to the end. Uh, uh, one of the characters is to interview you. Can you talk about that in your book? Can you tell us about the interviewing and your heroines or your villains? Could you ask one more time? That um, little girl. Sure. Sorry, it's all new Google stuff. <laughs> no problem. Uh, one of the things you said in your book about getting to know your characters is a great technique to do that is to actually interview your heroine or interview your villain. Can you talk about that a little bit? Oh, it's the greatest. You know, it's the old thing, like in school you do sock puppets, you know, like you, like you can do it like sock puppets, except you can do it on paper. And it's really good to do it if you're in an alter state, if you're tired or you're on a plane or you've just wakened up or you've had a glass of wine or whatever. And literally, you, you cast yourself as either the anonymous interviewer or the bartender or whatever, and you say to your character, and you're going to write this, so what happened was... You know, and if you're me, you're going to cast your your character as an actor, living or dead, and you're going to let them talk to you. And like it's that. very helpful when you're trying to plot because if you don't know what happens next, trust me, they do. I like that, and I like also the idea of what you said, casting um, your your character with an actor, living or dead. So if you want to use um, uh, Humphrey Bogart, or you want to use Julia Roberts, or someone like that, it helps crystallize your character. Also, if you play a, a movie that you like them in, you start to be able to, you're, you know, hearing the voice. You know, in fiction, it's all about hearing the voice, um, and it's a good technique to bring into screenwriting because you know you're a novelist, Jeff, and you know, you know that you, when they start talking to you, that's when you get up on the table and start dancing, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, right. So, um, so you know, uh, so screenwriters can have the same effect by, you know, if they can hear John Wayne murmuring their lines, or they can see. Humphrey Bogart, you know, as their detective and start to hear the voice, you know, that is what will get the thing really going. Right. Well, I want to thank you so much, Professor Horowitz, for your time and for your generosity today. I encourage everybody to go and get her, a copy of her book, which is The Four Magic Questions of Screenwriting. You can get a copy at her website, which is MarilynHorowitz.com, or, of course, Amazon.com or any of the we other websites. Have our website special. If you, go, if you go to my new website, we're offering you the book free if you buy one of my video classes. So please do that, MarilynHorowitz.com, which is spelled, can you spell that for us? M-A-R-I-L-Y-N-H-O-R-O-W-I-T-Z dot com. Easy to remember. Marilyn with brown hair and Horowitz not talented at the piano. <laughs> and if you uh, if you missed that, all you have to do is take a look 
her lower third, which is on her screen right now, and you can actually spell it out right there and just add .com to it. You can get it. Thank you so much, Professor Horowitz. Sending you a virtual hug, darling. I hope I see it one of the author 101s. I hope so, too, or down here in Costa Rica. <laughs> Absolutely. We'll talk. Take Let's care. talk. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.